We speak greetings unto be at Yisrael scattered throughout the nations of the earth whereby the Ruach HaChodash, the power of his life rests upon his arm, his nation, his people, his Bochir, the elect. According to his passion, we must understand that Almighty Yahweh has elected a nation to represent him among the council of the Zachin, the Zachinim, the elders of his elect. And so Almighty Yah has elected a people to stand before the nations of the earth, before the people of the earth to declare the significance of his power, his might, his supremacy among the gods that is greater than all. And that we as a nation, as the old verbiage of the proverb, quote, action speaks louder than one's verbiage, unquote. So it is the actions of Yisrael that speaks with a great fervor of expression of whom he is, what he is, and his value unto us as a nation and individual and the wealth of his knowledge, his truth revealed through the power of Yeshua HaMashiach. So we stand here on this Shabbaton in awe of his excellence, his mighty power, and as the old Hiroshi would say, all that he has done for me. I am one that is in constant verbal talk with Torah. My mind constantly speaks in Torah as I constantly refresh myself ministering. Because when the Ru'ach HaChodesh comes, it will not speak of a personality, but it will speak of that which he has, Yishemach. He has heard, he hears with great understanding, with obedience unto the hearing of what he speaks. There is no personality to establish because the Ru'ach HaChodesh is Yah, because Yah is Ru'ach. And he comes to bring life above all. Yah said, Yoshua HaMashiach. He came to give, or he sent the Ru'ach to give a riveting report of the excellence of the power of his HaMashiach, that it is real. And we know that it is real because it is alive in the bosom of this Raya. There is nothing like the simplicity of your truth. I'm so glad, my Ima, that he made it so simple. As I'm often talking to Yah, he answers me by Torah. My mind gravitates to specifics in the book. And I will find myself trying to see that in the visual form by expediting my labor that day and make a direct path to the Torah. It is one thing that the simplicity of Torah, it is so simple. And it is predicated upon one Component, and I'll tell you what that component is, is simple. If thou can't believe, but then all things are possible. 
It is the simple fact that if we can believe, there's nothing complex about that. If we simply can believe, then what the Torah says that the possibilities of Torah it is revealed unto us, Yisraya, but we must believe. It doesn't take any kind of intellectual capacity to believe. It's simply trusting. It's almost like the child in the comforting arm. As I watched little Yeshaya last week, he says to his avat, and he said it in such a compassionate way. Well, when he was with me, I said, sit there and don't budge. Don't even smile at me, boy. Tough for you to sit for 15 minutes, but I'm going to sit you before me. And he sat. I said, don't smile at me. I don't want your smiles. So as his avat was headed out to work, he says, Daddy, see you later. Won't be long. He's going to see his house. If we simply can believe Yisrael, that's the simplicity. We have a stupid generation. The men are stupid. And the women have no guard of the essentials of Yah because they don't see the action of silly, immature boys. We need strong men. And I am a strong man. Believe that, whether you buy it or not. If we simply can believe, can I give us a, an analogy I'm going to teach today? <clears throat> and I hope I can do it with the preciseness of the erudition, the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. The shrewdness of his learned ability as he brought out to us on Chidvei. Amen. If I use the expression, the pedagogy, or the wisdom and the knowledge of that circumstance of Torah revelation, that it may be brought out in its most simplistic terms of understanding and knowledge. If we are a nation that simply believes, we can but that. It is that what you read, you have great confidence in. You must have confidence in it. It must be the final resolution of all activities and circumstances. And above all, my precious Ochot, we must get excited about it. I don't care what it is, whether it's correction, whether it is the gift of revelation and knowledge. And when a man is excited, you will see it in his ponim, his ma'or. The excellence of his wisdom shines. This is a dumb generation. Men look dumb. They look stupid. Their faces. Yesterday when the little ones received a little small gift, I noticed that there were some bills that, of course, currency passed through the hands of multiples many times over. And people tend, as I do, write on currency. I will write names. or. And on one of the Labath of Tizayon, on the currency was written 780. When I looked at it, I said, oh, okay. And so when she received her currency, she was excited. So she tells the little ones, uh, Look at what Papi gave me, 780. I wish I had the 780. But of course, sometimes we hear things, we don't get excited like that little child just over something written on that dirty thing. Yet we don't get excited over what is written. In the Torah of Yah. He's going to move out everything and everyone that is an offense to him. I don't give 
a damn who you are. I'm saying to you all that are here, not one of us is that important. Not your damn monies, not your labor, it doesn't mean a damn thing. And I don't give a damn if you take offense to it. I say it for you to take offense. Makes no difference who you are. I will. I'm not afraid of this wicked generation. And you will be the last one that I will be afraid of. For he give us the ruach of yira yari to fear him. It's vitally important to understand why. And I hope to teach on that today. And to bring insight unto the nation of Yisra'ya that is most valuable at this time. I want to teach as a learned at scholar. What does that imply? Well, the erudition to speak with knowledge, shrewdness, understanding. And my scholarship is in one thing alone. And that is the excellence of Torah discipline. According to the living testimony that's in the bosom of Yisra'ya. That's my scholarship. It doesn't extend beyond the historical events or activities uh, whereby there are multiples of millions of books written that I have an extensive library that is beyond one's comprehension uh, that how can one read all of those books? I have the book, the Sefer, the book of life. And he has written that in the bosom, in the Laba of Yisrael. And when we embrace, entreat, or see one from a far distance, uh, that it calls the ma'o of the light uh, of knowing that, yeah, his nation is a people that's scattered abroad. Uh, it causes a great jubilation. Yeah. And there is jubilation, there is gladness and excitement uh, as they would do on tabernacle when they would see those that they had not seen since the last tabernacle, they would rejoice with great gladness. There is an Ahotz. She sends gifts here very quietly. You saw a picture of the woman, you would know she's a very attractive woman. And she will write occasionally and say to me, Re'ach David, as she did. I didn't bring the letter to read. She says, the Teshua community and the teachings and the preachings have been such a blessing of enrichment to me. And you stand for the defense of truth. And it makes no difference whom the individual is, male or female. Uh, there is no respect to their contributing and what they think their worth is. Not in the precise words, but in that wording. So my reply to her was, We're glad that the website and by the way, she found us on YouTube, has been a little assistance in your growth, in your pursuit of the knowledge of your Yeshua, whereby you may be strengthened, you may grow in that manner, and all those that are with you. So she writes me back and says, Re'ak. It is not that I've grown little. And she capitalized that to emphasize, no, sir. For I have grown exponentially with great understanding of Torah and what a blessing it is. That y'all granted us me to find one of the videos on YouTube and I was able to go from there. So we greet you all, you my achots, you know who you are, our friends, our listeners, our enemies, 
We greet you all in your surest mighty name. We're here today to feed you to Ochel. Ochel. To give you meat to eat, to digest in your ruach. That you may be strengthened according to the will of Yah to be my enemy, my oyeb. Or you may be strengthened to be my reach, my friend, as we pursue with a great vengeance against the kingdom of hell and darkness that has perched in our own laba, in our own minds, that we assaulted. And all salted with the sword of the Ruach of Almighty Yah. So we greet you all, you that are ailing. We're going to pray at the end of the service for you. We want to feed you some delicious soup first. And someone is sick. But as a young lad, I would watch my grandmother, this sturdy woman, big, bonded, and strong. I would watch her as she was top the hills that led from our shack to make sure that one near the little dwelling place of ours that needed assistance, that she would take her journey early in the morning because she knew no watch. She simply could understand the time by the sun. And she would walk that course. I don't know the distance which she had to travel, but I would watch as her silhouettes and her figure would become more diminished as she walked that journey. And in the evening, you could look at that same spot to make haste. You had done what she commanded. We are a nation that must be gotten to make haste. And then began to cleanse ourselves because your flesh is filthy. It is filthy physically because you don't give a damn. Your mind is filthy. Your body is filthy. And your ruach is distasteful. It is a damn vile thing. It doesn't emit the very beauty of the sweet fragrance of Yoshua Hamashi. I detest that in any man. Listen, don't make me angry. I'm talking to you all. And I'm not afraid to tell you that. Makes no difference who you are. And I would watch in the evening as we could see the small silhouettes. As the sun would begin to go down, we would see this woman arriving. And when she got near, she looked as a bohemian of a woman because we were little. But we knew the instructions of that old woman that we had to faithfully obey. And when it got later in the evening, you knew you did not have much time. And so you expedited things very quickly to make sure that everything was in order. We don't have the time that we had yesterday. We don't have the time that we had when we came into Yan's house. The Zachin Yeramiyah, he often speaks of the final or the finality, the Akharith, the last hour, the eighth, the time, the event. That's what the word hour implies in Torah. When it talks about an hour, it is not talking about increments of measurement. When he used the word if, it is talking about the events, the occurrence of that which shall be. Yes. And we are in the last hour, Yisrael. I want you to understand. We're in the final, the ach arith. We're in the final if. What shall be the gaba, the strength, the might, the power, the assurance of Yisra'ya. What is our strength today? 
You can't tell the strength of a man because he masquerades in his juvenile insecurity that he thinks he's strong. Yeah. That's not the gabba of a man. Yeah. And so we have many of these weak, fledgling boys uh, that don't even have the similitude of a man. Uh, their minds do not simulate the strength of a man. Uh, and so they walk in frivolity and folly and a juvenile state. They're not men. They're, not, they're boys. They have not the strength of Yah. They're insecure. And so you wonder why the woman running around so raggedy. She doesn't look beautiful. She's not appealing to any of the nations of the earth. She presents no tifera to intrigue the visual of one. She offers nothing of beautiful coloration to excite the mind. Do not colors cause certain tentacles or certain activities in the mind? Sure it does. I love to see the rawness of colors, the beauty of colors. I love colors, beautiful colors, bright colors, exciting colors. I love it. Always have love colors. And they all are beautiful and they all match. And the multiples, the singularities of them, they all match. We have been taught that they don't match. We have been given this understanding that those two have clashed. No, colors have clashed. Because the rainbow of Yah's beauty, it is expressed in the mind of Yisra'iyah. And the thing that sets precedent upon that, it is our ponim, our faces. So I'm going to teach today I'm going to speak with wisdom, understanding of the matter that I speak from, because I've labored to understand a small scintilla of this matter. This may be part one and part two will come, maybe next Shabbat or whenever, or one of the Ach may speak. Part 2, 3, and the continuation. I want to open the door today, Yisrael. And I want to deal with an aspect that the Torah calls, it calls it the final or the Ach Arith. The time that comes to its conclusion. There is no more time to correct one's issue. It is the finality. It is the Akharith, the last hour, or the final hour for Yisrael. And the question I impose unto us as a nation of people, how does, how can, and how will a nation prevail? How will we have the gaba, the strength, the might, the fortitude, the character, the beauty to overcome even the greatest of circumstances that shall take root in the mind of man. And in order to give us some kind of balance, hopefully how I will proceed in this teaching. I want to begin in the teaching of the Brit Hadassah, the Brit Hadassah. It is the covenant whereby our heart, our Levi'im, they have been circumcised by the cutting. That is why it is the covenant of Milah, of the covenant of the circumcision. That you give no place for your flesh, no strength to your damn carnal mind. When a mind is carnal, it is always enmity against the Torah of Sadiq. 
You see it in the countenance of this damnable, foolish, stupid, immature generation. Men of their own ability, they will show you a false delusion for a day or two and they go back to the same resolution. And that is the truth. They're immature. They have no character. I want to begin in the book. In the book of Marcus Lucas. In the book of Mark. Marcus. Precisely the 15th chapter of the book of Marcus Lucas. And it speaks of uh, my faith. The death. The precise order of the time, Yoshua HaMashiach, his death. I'm speaking this that we may garner the Gaba. We may be strong. Our minds may be powerful with resolute according to the confidence of Torah. That in the midst of all of the circumstances and trials, uh, we may have a resolute constitution. We will not be shaken. Because we understand what Yah is doing. It is vital. As I often say, to understand words. They have great implication when we define them according to the definitive. You cannot define a word... According to your ignorance, it must have, and it has, a definitive. It is the final authority of the actions, the deeds, and what the word orchestrate to paint a knowledge of that situation in one's mind. We have a stupid jackass generation that thinks it knows and it doesn't know. We got jackasses of men that are little boys, and the only thing they want to do uh, is ruffle the feathers of each other to give uh, the, the concept or the thought that they are knowledgeable and mighty in Torah. You will never see that in the book. And so they massage one another's egos. And when they get together, they don't get together to learn. They get together to run their damn mouths. A wise man always listens, my Bethany Zion. Because he knows that in Shemach, he always becomes wiser. You will know that a damn fool, the first thing he does is open his mouth. And if you work with me, I will say, don't talk. I said to Yosef yesterday, I love the garden work. I really do. I love working the garden. So when I get older, if we're around, if I'm here, Jacqueline's full authority began to evolve. If you give me one job, I will take care of the garden with my issue. If she does nothing but watch me, that's all that matters. She doesn't has to hoe, I will do all the hoe. I love the garden. And I can work there every day, honestly. Every day, all day. I can work the garden all day long. I don't have to come out of it. I see the beauty of the plants. I see the beauty of the seeds rising by the command of God. I love doing that. Because there is always something to do. And when I do that, it is a, an attentiveness unto my own life and the things that tend to grow out of uh, the nonsense, the frivolity, and the non-essentials uh, that I pay attention to. So I constantly weed. I don't care if I weed it today, I will weed tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And I love that. It is one of the best therapeutic uh, type of exercises one can do mentally, physically, and above all spiritually, because we see the hand of Almighty Yahweh. I literally love the garden work. I'd rather do that than to build. I'd rather do that than to lay blocks. And I can do it all. But I love the aspect of gardening. And when I come out of the garden, I feel exhausted. But then it balanced everything. It balanced my eating, my attitude. We must have the right Ruach Yisrael. We're not going into the kingdom. You keep 
constantly in our own pursuit of our own ways and our own attitude. When Yah often reproves us, then his destruction comes. And that is without any warning at all, Yisra'ya. That's nothing more wiser than we taking heed to the warning of Almighty Yahweh. We're in the final, we're in the Akharis, we're in the final hours. And it's one thing that we're all going to face, that is the Mahdi, and seemingly the prematurity of death upon us. And one dies because of their delusion and their disdain for the moral characters and the qualities of what Torah speaks unto one's mind. When one thinks that he or she is above that, but one thinks that the word of Yah is not for them. That's, uh, that is a demented mind of darkness. And one thinks that the Torah doesn't speak to them. When one thinks that he or she uh, has graduated above that and it is everyone else. No, it's you. You damn fool. It's you. It's not someone else. Torah says in the book of Marcus Lucas, Mark chapter 15. It talks about at the beginning of the Deshe or the ninth hour. I know we will read that and we think we understand what this implies. We are students that have learned to read but not well. Because when one learns to read, uh, then one must define what is being spoken to their intellectual capacity that they may convey that to others, that there is great clarity in their speech, not some mumbling and jumbling of speech and trying to correlate Torah that is of no significance to the matter and the issue that you're discussing. You find men today can't even quote too damn scripture. And they think they're wise. It was the ninth hour. It was the Tishe. Is that Pacific, the ninth hour? When someone says to you, you report to the job at 7 a.m., does that imply 9 a.m. or 10? It implies that. So you think that when Yah speaks, that things are, are not relevant for us to understand. You think he just instilled the word ninth in there for no reason at all. Uh, we began to understand the numerology or the numeric of Yah's creation. We will understand what this teshe means and it implies. We're talking about the final judgment. We're talking about the final act. We're talking about the final act of his judgment. Uh, and that is what this is about. And we will see this through the dynamics of the course of Torah from Bereshit unto Gilion. It was the ninth hour, the Sha'ah, the ninth hour, the Sha'ah, this hour. It implies it was the time that this shall be revealed. It was the ninth hour, and look at what it implies. It says, Yoshua he kara, with the utterance of his voice, uh, he cried with a loud, and Yah uses the expression uh, gadol, with a voice that is so robust, that is so strong, uh, and of all things, a voice of great importance. It said that Yoshua cried with a loud voice, uh, saying, Eloi, Eloi, yeah. Yahweh, he says, Lama Shabbat Tanai, which is interpret the last hour, the final hour. He says, My Almighty, my Almighty, why have you forsaken me? Why have you a Zab? Now, I know our intellectual proudness, which it's applicable to the meeting that we will think that this azab or the forsakening means that he has turned his back. He has lost contact. That's why we must be students. 
And we must be able to hear that you can learn the definitives of this word and this application. Now, I want to define this word by its Hebraic application for this application. It says, Azab, he asks, why have you forsaken me? And for us to understand that we believe that one has left one alone, they have departed, they have segregated, separated themselves from that. But that's not uh, what he was implying. He was said unto you, this is what azab means, and it's primitive or the root of this word, whether it is Ugaritic, whether it is Hebraic, whether it is Aramaic or Ethiopic, the primitive or its origin, that it is expressed in multiples of definitives. But the primitive, the primitive, the small, minute measure of this word of azab, it is loosen. Why haven't you loosened me, Yah, unto death? It also means to relinquish. And then above all my hope, it means, Yah, permit this thing to be finished. Do you all hear me? I know how our intellectual capacity uh, teach us, uh, because we all are smart, are we not? Uh, well, ask one of the little children how smart one is, and they will begin to show you. That's the way we are. It must be a great pursuit to find the riches of Torah. It must be an untiring uh, pursuit to understand. That's why we need men of great strength and fortitude of character that go beyond the physical application of what one thinks something means. Uh, that's what scholarship is. You dig to the primitive root of all things. So what he was saying, my hosts, he was saying to Almighty Yahweh, Abba, in the midst of the thralls of the agony of death, when even my natural components of my mind try me, he asked Yahweh, have you not, Azab? Why have you not allowed this thing for me to be loosened from this. Take me through what I should go through, yeah? Because he knew, because he is the Torah, he knew that Yah can never, his Torah is always forever established in the Shemaim. Yeah. He can never denounce his word, his Dabarim. Yeah. It was not that Yah, he cannot abandon his word. No more than he can abandon his people. He cannot do that. He cannot abandon his Torah. He cannot abandon his mitzvah. He cannot do it. And so this azab was, yeah, why have you not loosened me to the course that you have ordained, to the way that Torah has expressed in the mouths of the Naviim and the Shulishiaka? Why have you not allowed me to be loosened, to take the course that is appropriate for me? Why have you not relinquished this body uh, unto the process of death uh, to prove uh, that you have permitted all things to be and death will have no uh, ma, no stain upon my nephesh. Uh, it will not pollute me. The worm shall not overtake me uh, because I am life. I live. Uh, even death lives because of me. We must understand that, Yisrael. We're in the final hour. We're in the archive between the sixth and the ninth hour, Yisrael. Yeah. Why have you forsaken me, Azab? Why have you not loosened me, Abba? Loose me unto the challenge of death, unto the thralls of death and hell. Loose me unto the shod dim, the demons of darkness, for I shall go down with the Gaba. I shall prevail. We are Israel, and we shall prevail against every demonic force, every power of hell. I don't give a damn if nobody stands with you. 
You shall prevail. You shall gather. You shall be strong. You shall have the might of you. You shall have the power of the knowledge of the riches of Yahshua HaMashiach. And Yahshua said, loose me to death. He said, let death prevail against me. Let it be permitted, yes, for I have, and I am the Gaba. I am the power that prevail against all his Torah. His Dabarim prevails against all things, every situation, every trial, every activity of hell that he has permitted to try us. He commanded the Abba, why have you not Azab permitted? Why have you not allowed this to occur? Let it occur, Ya. Let it be so. For I know that your word stands against the workings of hell. That's why David said, I want to hide it. In my laba, in my love, why that I will not sin against Ya? You don't hide that. There are those that can recall precise events, activities that have no relevance. But yet when it comes to the Torah, they can't recall one scripture, one khattu, one verse, a strength. They cannot do that. Azan. Hallelujah. Why have you forsaken me? So if that implies that Yah has abandoned his people, I want to deal with this number nine for a moment. I will show you what it implies. We're in the sixth to the ninth hour of my Zachin. It is the final hour. And those that are of true Torah, they will know that Yah will not azab. They will say, let it be Yah. For your strength shall be prevail, your Gaba. We are Yisrael. We are the ones that prevail. Yeah. Yeah. Shaul speaks so emphatically here in 2 Corinthians. Corinth, yeah. The question to our minds, does Yah forsake his people? And even in the midst as Shaul speaks unto the nation here, Corinth, Yah, to Yisrael, Yah, their afflictions were great. And the multitude of them that were beyond one's expectation. They were looking for the coming of Yoshua HaMashiach because of the agony of their pain. And we sense that uh, through these old Mora bodies, we sense pain. Uh, we sense death. Uh, we sense the agony of all uh, of that which we have sown in our bodies. Uh, and no man, no woman escapes. Be not deceived, yes, not more. We sow things. And we reap them. Is that our correction? No, it's to show you, Yah is correct. So shall we speak with great confidence here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. He speaks of the great affliction. He says, persecuted, I have been tried. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. He said, although I am persecuted, afflicted, and the great pains of the throes of death, he said, yet through all that, yet I am not a zap, I am not forsaken, for he is with Yisrael. He can only say that he could only reply unto that nation uh, of Yisrael that way because uh, he had to understand the tenets of Torah. He could not speak that of his own accord. Uh, it had to be based, predicated uh, upon what is written. He said, I'm afflicted. I'm persecuted in great pains. He said, but not forsaken. He said, I've been cast down to the death of the earth. He said, but not uh, Shomad, I'm not destroyed. Uh, although the elements of darkness rise up against me, and although the very pains and the thralls of the pains of death and life uh, rise up, he doesn't destroy Yisrael. I'm not destroyed. We must have the Gaba, the power to prevail uh, in these last hours and the final hours uh, of this day, Yisraya. We're in the Yom, the day of Yah. We're in the time uh, whereby the events occur and they happen uh, as they are prophesied. They are supposed to happen. 
And if then if they don't happen, then Yah is not true. He is not true, Yisra'ya. Although I am persecuted, my mind is afflicted with the great afflictions of darkness. My imuna is tried on every hand. And there are times I don't know which way to turn. You turn to what is written. You turn to what is written in the Sefa and what he has written in your bosom, in your Laban. When Yaha taps this in us, we remember, it is stirred up by our speakers and our Zahim and those that instruct us. It stir up the pure mind. And what is that pure mind? It is, it is the testimony of Yahshua HaMashiach. It's of the pure mind by way of Zachar, remembering uh, the great things of the Zigrons, uh, the memorials of Yah. That's what it does. This is a cold, wicked generation. That's why the expression of this generation is cold and wicked. Got to get the heart of your shoe. We got the heart, we got the mind, and the mind we got his attributes. He said, although. It seems as though that I am in the great captivity of perplexities. He said, I am not forsaken. Hallelujah. He has not loosened you or that upon you to overtake you. He will not permit it, Yisrael, although he permits it. To subdue the mind of Yoshua. That's why Yoshua says, O oh, Abaya, he cried out to him, Why hast thou forsaken? Why don't you loosen me? Let it try me. Permit it to be so. Let it be so, O oh, Maria, that the power of your testimony. Because I came to honor to give great God all unto your name. That was his last prayer. We're in the Akhrit, the final hour. The final, not day, but the final hour between the sixth and the ninth hour. And I will show us why we're in that hour. Shaus made a statement. We must have the foundation of just one witness in Torah, whereby we can lay our confidence on that statement that he made unto the scattered elect of Kurat Yah. Well, the Novi Yeremiah, he gives us concretely firm truth as even the voice of Shaul in Yeremiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. So we know Yahshua was not implying that the Father had cut him off. Jeremiah chapter 51. Yeremiah 51 and verse 5. It says, for Yisrael, for the nation, for his arm. Jeremiah 51, verse 5. He says, for his people, his nation, for Yisrael has not been. For Yisrael has not been. He doesn't use the word Azam. He uses the words Alma. They have not been forsaken. The word Alma implies that they have not been discarded as a woman. Who, have been, who has been discarded by her husband. Uh, she has not been Alma. She has not been forsaken. That's why Shaul could speak emphatically for the assurance of the heart of Yisra'ya. For Yah has not forsaken. He has not Alma. He has not forsaken. He has not discarded. He has not divorced. Although we are a raging whore. We produce some of the most vilest of filth. The nidda that one can ever imagine. And yet he has not alma. He has not discarded us. He has not given us a writing of divorcement. He has not divorced his nation. Yisraya. And that's a fact, Yisraya. Yah has not, for Yisraya is not forsaken. He says, for neither is Yehuda the whole. 12 tribes as Arazakin try to implore us on Kitve Imat that he brought all 12 tribes Hallelujah. over Yardan. I tell you, my Zakin, that we might as well keep that one for uh, Sukkot. I didn't realize you had that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So that will be the theme of our sukkah, beyond Jordan. I said to him one day, Zaki, just let's teach on beyond Jordan uh, for Pesach. And of course, uh, we got caught up in certain things. Uh, and I told him, you teach, preach, whatever you want to do. But Yah knew that we needed that on Khatve Iman, all right? Beyond Jordan. As he opened up the rivers uh, and the floods of the Suf, the great rage of the Red Sea, uh, so shall he do it when this beast open up the floodgates of demonic powers uh, that shall flood against Yisrael. Yeah, we shall have the Gaba. That's why we need to get our minds stable. That's why we need strong, mature. We need, uh, we need the Ish. We need men of great strength and physicality. And you know that they're men of physicality and strength. Uh, we don't need immature boys trying to instruct the nation of Yisrael. Yeah. We need men that are refined, that are contained, uh, containing their emotion, their immaturity, and men that are strong, that's what we need. Uh, and I don't give a damn whether you reject it or not. Uh, you can exude yourself when you have that character and that strength, uh, it will speak for you at great volume. Uh, no one, you don't have to speak of it. I was in the storm at Rafi and I on Thursday. I like to tell these examples. And there was a couple. And uh, of course, we walk into the store, and Sam's, they still have the greeters. And they were enthused to greet this woman. It's amazing that when I venture into those places by myself, it's a different attitude. And it's a fact. So, this woman, she sees Rafa, and she knows us by the years of us coming. She greets her with a hearty, how are you? Morning to you. And so when she sees this man with his staunchness, when I say that it is not a facial expression of meanness, but my steps are sure. My attitude is sure, and I don't play around. When she saw me, it was almost like a coldness enveloped. Of course, I wasn't offended. You don't have to speak to me, ma'am. I'm not offended at that. That's your job, but I'm not offended. And there was an elderly, I would say a couple in their early 60s. It is one thing that when people, when, when, when they want to touch you, they, they want to assure you. And so, let, let me show you something. Start up, Rafa. It's one thing, I understand the protocol of etiquette, meeting people. When someone, if you're like this, and when someone, if they touch you on your elbow, that, that is of great significance. That means that I'm comfortable, I'm sure, you, you're a pleasant individual. You understand. And so this elderly, this woman, we almost, she didn't bump me, I did bump her, and she would just, oh, I, I, I'm so sorry, I, I, I'm so, I said, ma'am, everything is well. That, that wasn't why she did that, I understand, you understand. We are the soldiers of Yah. We are the warriors. We make a statement wherever we go. And our statement is the power of His might prevailing. We're not one that clown with frivolity and fervor. Our countenance is sure. It's not unpleasant, but it's pleasant. And people just don't know how to respond to that. Because they don't see a fledgling of a weak thing. They see something that they don't see. I received an email from one that reacted, help me, teach me. Very few men that are there that speaks with strong conviction, that convict you of your ills and your sins. That's what the letter says. And I found you. I've sat under these men, but I've gone as far as I can go with them. There's really nothing there to excite me. What I found... The teaching from here, it is of great conviction. It convinces me of my sin. Anytime your conversation with Akachot doesn't convince you of your ill, it's not even worth having. They're idle, wasted words. Because everything that Yah speaks, it judges us and refines us. That's what it does. Yisra'ya, 
you're not forsaken. Neither is your Huda of your Abba, of the great Yah. He says, the Abba of Sava, he is the one of the hosts uh, of the armies. Uh, he said, though your land, though the land was filled with sin uh, against the Kadosh one of Yisraya and our minds, our Erech, uh, the places that our mind go, it is filled with sin against Yah. And although our minds and our thoughts, our attitude, our actions are uh, against Yah, he has not, uh, oh, no, he has not divorced us. He has not turned us loose and cut away from us. He has not cut his attachment unto Yisra'iah. He said, although there is much sin in the heart of Yisra'iah against me, I have not forsaken you, my nation. You are my people. I will shut at the gate a God like Yeremiah. He will not be afraid of your faces. He will look you in your wicked eyes that you think are strong. He will see down into the depths of your shallow, weak ways and tell you. Uh, he will tell you the very word of Yah. Second Baruch. If you began to study the book of Baruch, he begins to see the visions of Hashemite. As Yah began to reveal unto him what we call the apocalyptic or the great and the final judgment. Now you can't read that and understand that in one verse. You got to go back to chapter 15, I believe, uh, chapter 27 of 2nd Baruch. Uh, and he begins to reveal uh, this great event and the cataclysmic mayhem. Uh, listen, just listen to me. In order to understand what shall transpire... And the verse that I'm going to read, uh, you cannot get the conclusiveness of it uh, without going back uh, to chapter 27. And it says in 2 Baruch, uh, chapter 27, and verse 9. Hear this, Baruch. It says in the ninth, listen, the ninth part. The ninth, it is a time of great judgment. It is the final calamity of judgment upon nations and upon people. He says in 2 Baruch 27 verse 9, the night part, it says the fall of the fire. In the ninth part, in the final judgment, there shall be the fire, the yush, the power of Yahs. He is a man of war, of his manhood. That shall fall upon the corruption of the nations. And it shall eradicate all the dross from among the people of Yah. It says in the second, in the ninth part, the fire shall fall. And in the process of this revelation, there were visions uh, and understanding of events that would transpire. And this is the catalyst of this ninth or the ninth hour. Second Baruch. 64.1, and I will show you, according to Torah, that what he says, it is implicit to what happened between the sixth and the ninth hour. It says in 2 Baruch 64, verse 1, he says, and the ninth black waters you have seen, he said, that is the wickedness that existed in the days of Manasseh, and Hezekiah, you'll hear that. And we understand the judgment of Yah. That Hezekiah, he had to cry out. Uh, that a memorial that Yah remembered the zikron uh, of Hezekiah. He talks about the ninth black waters. The waters whereby there is no life. The ninth black waters whereby the judgment uh, of Yah's fire shall fall upon the nations. Has he forsaken his people? Has he given us the living water to drink, Yahshua? Yes. Or all the waters blackened, uh, marred with sin? He said the ninth waters uh, represents the sins uh, of his nation, his people. It represents the power of the Milak or the kingdom ruler, uh, what has been permitted or allowed uh, that would have gone on to his ability to comprehend uh, and to see everything in the book uh, is of value and importance. You will not understand the ninth waters. Until you understand what your shoes speak. The final judgment. Listen, Yisrael. These are the final judgment. 
These are the knife black borders that we shall see. In order to understand that quickly, turn to Lucas. And I want to get back to that. The book of Lucas. Luke, Lucas. Luke chapter 23 and verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour. It was about that Shesha, the sixth hour. And Yah says, and there was darkness. There was Hoshak. The minds had no fear of Yah. About the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The judgment. The supreme final judgment of Yah. Baruch says, and the nine waters represents the wickedness, the sin. And that's what that darkness was for the whole Shekh. Whereby the light of Torah, the light of the Ma'o of Yahshua would not shine through to this dark generation. Even in the midst of all of that darkness, he did not forsake his nation. As Azakain Yaramaya brought out to us on Kitvei Meta, he said, to the midst of all of the darkness of light, there was a fire of Yah's great ambience, his Ruach, the fire of his word, the fire of his presence that they were led by. They were led by that fire. He said, and during the day, he covered them with a cloud and the pillar of the cloud that cooled them in the midst of the bemidst bar. Yeah. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness. And the dark mayhem represents the sin, the wickedness of a nation. Yorkshire is the mayhem. He is the living water. We drink from that well, we will thirst no more. The wells that we're drinking from, they're dark wells. They're wells that are polluted. They're wells whereby the final judgment of Yah is going to incur, occur upon us as a nation. And the beauty of all of that, of all of that judgment, we shall gaba, we shall have strength, we shall prevail, we shall overcome. We shall be the people that are enriched. As the old ones say, if we hold on, you're not going to sin continuously because there's a remnant that he's going to break free. There's a residue that he's going to pull out of the hole and they shall be your shepherd. Not everyone that says, Yorkshire, Yorkshire, have I done this in your name? I gave money, I worked, I labor. He's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I know you're not. You have no experience with me. You don't even know who I am. Because you're full of you and your sins and your damn corruptions. That's what he says. He, say, he says, depart. When Yah says depart, there is no entrance into the kingdom, Yisrael. Just get away from my door. Your shoe is that door. And when the doorkeeper says, get away, you know we are in trouble. He said, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. That was Hoshech. There was great darkness in the earth until the ninth hour. Why the ninth hour? Because the final judgment, the final judgment is finished. It is the finality. It is the Akharith. It is the final judgment. And the voice of this great physician, Lucas, as he revealed by the hearing of the Ruach, he says, and the shemash of the sun was darkened. It gave no light. Even the sun, the light of Yah Sadiq that hang on that stake, uh, there was no light unto the eyes uh, of those of Yehuda and Yisra'ya. It was caught up in the cloak of their darkness. Uh, he says, uh, he said the sun, not only the physical sun, uh, but neither was the sun of Sadiq that Melakia talks about, that shall arise with what? Uh, with the muppet, the healing uh, of Yah in his wings, Yisra'ah. We need to allow the Torah to arise in us uh, with the healing of Yah. He says, and the sun was darkened. And then he said, the veil of the Be'er HaMikdash, it was split in two. It was cut down the middle. 
Moshe said when they began to build their God, their calves, he came into the camp. He says, who's on your side? Who's going to stand with you? And the house was divided. And those that stood with him, the Levi took their swords and their death weapons. And they were about to kill everything and to destroy everything. That was an offense to Yah. And we must destroy it. I'm not going to patronize your damn wicked ways. I'm not going to soothe you. Your damn man, grow up and stop acting like a boy. Your woman, then let your beauty shine and stop acting damn silly and foolish. I said to my Rafi, I said, it's amazing. <clears throat> this woman, her job to speak to individuals, she will not greet me, but she greet the patron behind me. He was a man. I say, you see how silly they are. They're sitting over at the table with David. So when David sees Raphael, he smiles at her. When he sees me, he doesn't particularly care for me. And say, I say, you see how silly and immature they are. The laughter can be heard in this place. And of course, I had to take care of a little affair so I had to walk past them. And so when I get to the table and get in their proximity, everything gets quiet. You don't have to abide. It's still the truth. That's the way it should be for us. That's who we are. I'm not selling myself for a cheap $2 bill. I'm not sold that easily. I know who and what I am. And I make my boast in your sure Hamashiach. I don't sell myself for some kind of infatuation of superlatives to tell me I'm a fine man. Go to hell. I don't need that. I don't need no one to tell me I'm a strong man. I know who I am. I don't need accolades to soothe some kind of superficial juvenile conscience. I don't need that. I know who he is. And that's all that matters to me. I know who he is. And he knows who I am. And that's all that matters. I don't give a damn if this world doesn't know who I am. So what? The, the veil was rent in the Bay at Miklash. Then, the final hour of judgment. Verse 46. And when Yoshua Hamashiach had cried with a loud voice. You see that? This was the final hour, the ninth hour. The ninth hour. Then, when he had cried with a loud voice, he says unto the Abba, he said, into your hand, into your yards. I commend my Ruach. And having said this, he gave up the Ruach HaKodash. The ninth hour prevail. The final judgment. The final judgment of everything that has been done against Yah. And yet, who shall prevail? Who shall gaba? Who are those that shall be strong and with the might of Yah? Well, the Torah tells us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, now when the centurion saw the one that was the captain of at least 100. That's what a centurion was. He was a warrior. He was a gaba. He was a strong man. He was a strong man. His body was erect. He was dressed in the gala of a mighty warrior. And that's what we are. We are warriors, but you must have on the war garment. We got to have our feet shod with the preparation of the message of Shalom. Our breastplate, when someone sees us, they must see the Sadiq of Almighty Yah. We must have a sword. We know that is the Dabarim of Almighty Yah. We must have on the helmet. Your shoe must be our head. And our loins, our desire, our passion must be guarded with the truth of Torah. That's what must be done, Yisrael. Not this damn passive, superficial, ignorant look that we find upon the, this damn, the superficial generation. And men that think in their men and their boys. The one who are daughters and are beautiful and strong, hell, they don't see men. 
You wonder why they say there are no men. Why? Because where are they? You got little boys that are trying to, to purport themselves as men and their boys. Immature boys. You got old men that is as immature as they were when they were 20. I grow every day, my imam. Every day I grow. Every day I see how shallow I was the day before. I will see how shallow this message. I will look back some weeks and months and say, wow, you could have laid that out better than that. You didn't have all the intricates of important uh, pieces for the house of Yisra'ya. And so that makes me improve on my preparation for the next. Where are the Geber? Where are the strong men? Where are the warriors? Where are they? That's why the Torah says in this ninth hour, you can't even trust in the Gerba. For his strength shall forsake him. Can't go around the Torah. When the centurion saw what was done, he honored and he praised Yah. See, a man that has rule over their own Ruach and knows how to rule the house of Yah, he has already ruled his house well. And you will know a rule of a man because his house is ruled well. His house is ruled well. And a man's issue is the, is the beauty of his strength. I don't give a damn what you say. That's just it. And when he goes, they see, when they see that, they see the beauty of his strength. And all man, the beauty of his strength is his wise nature. And all woman, the beauty of her strength is her wisdom. Her beauty, her charm, the way she walks, the way she talks. A shell man. Oh, damn fools today, all they're thinking about something sensual. They don't want to grow. You, you, you got to have the ruach of Yah. Even that act. Can I say this? I know I tend to ears you. That is one of the most beautiful things that Yah has given to a man and a woman to consummate all activities, to honor Him. And it is an activity that is beyond our polluted minds to understand the beauty of it. It is almost like a beastly action that has no significance of growth, beauty, and love. When it should be something that when it should be in its pure form, that it is brought together in one consummate event for she and him. And then they rest in the comfort of that beauty because uh, all of their strength is taken not here, there, and there. It is a summation of a great love and an affinity. And these damn dogs today don't even know that. Yeah. All they think about is some arousing of their filthy, dirty flesh. You don't even wash your arse well. You stink. Oh, our babies didn't understand that, but you that are adults, you should have. It is a one-time event. It is a one-time. It is not a beastly event. It's not like the lion 50 times, 100 times a day. It's one time. And it exacts every nature of a man and a woman at the same time. A damn beast wants to rouse one's own primordial or primitive state of mind. I don't care if you don't like me. Hell, the devil doesn't like me. I'm a man like you. I, I doubt that. I doubt if you like me. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Do I have the privilege, my son, to preach? I shall. Now, I don't apologize either. Someone write me and say, preach on, preacher. Someone will. All right, preach. 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 Hallelujah. It's one of the most beautiful events. And so when a man senses the beauty of that, he doesn't need to go beyond imagination. Neither does she. It draws a beauty of bond of great love. So when a man walks upright, you will not withhold any tough thing for him. I'm glad I got a pearl. I don't care what women say. I got a pearl. I don't talk like this because I know there are those that don't have one. I don't talk like this with my 
I understand his battles and I honor him and I love him and I care for him. I don't talk like this often. There are times I need to. For those that think they know. It's one of the most beautiful things that God's given unto a man. Nothing eclipses it. Nothing. And when he finds a wife, he gives them the same breath of that experience. It opens his heart, her heart, her mind. And then they relish, even in their tender sleep, every time. When it's right, you go to sleep. I'm not talking about beastly actions. Satisfy some arousing of your flesh that you've been expired by some naked whore, some man that you thought was fine. It's a damn wicked nation. And I'm a warrior. I got a cause that's greater than me. Damn my cause. My cause doesn't mean a damn thing. I will die, Yisrael. And I say this, I have too much in me not to open up the plethora every time I'm talking. No, I'm going to talk when I'm with the ark. You spend too much damn time on the computer. You work too long. You work too much. I will. It says this, when the centurion saw that in verse 47, he honored and praised Yah, saying, certainly this was a Sadiq man. He said, this man had the character of Yahweh. He is a Sadiq man. And all the people looked at that came together to that site. They saw this thing, beholding this thing which was done. They smote their breasts. You see what they did? They hit themselves. They smote their breasts. How often we do that? They smote their shot, their breasts. They smote their breasts. And then they return. The smiting of the breasts is a sign. It's saying, who am I? I'm worthless, yeah. yeah. And this is the most important aspect of all of this in verse 49. And all his acquaintance, and all of his acquaintance, and the woman, the women, Yisra'ya. He has taken, even though the sons of Yaakov multiplied the tribes of Yisra'ya, the woman represents the combination of her beauty or the strength of Yisra'ya. That's why men of Yisra'ya, their great honor should be upon the bath of Tizayon. That's why when the wife, when she honors, when she honors uh, the order of Yah, she orders, uh, honors the order of Yah in her husband's house. You, you, it's not more, much as you learning how to love him, just honor him. If you know how to honor him, the love will come. But you must be guided with honor. When there is dishonor, you will not love the man. And then because you honor him, does not Yah honor us? Uh, is he not speaking to us today? Uh? That's his honor, that's his God all. This is how much he honors you, that he's in the midst of a small house like this. Uh, and the few that have joined us, uh, yet he's in the midst of this gathering. Uh, and when a woman honors the man, uh, that it caused the volume of the floodgate of his heart to be opened, whereby he didn't understand the beauty of love, he will learn how to love her. And most men have not learned how to love. They don't know how to love. They're sensual like beasts. It's all about sensuality and sexuality. It's not about love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all of his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off and they saw this thing. That's about how we are. We're standing afar off from his truth. We see one that walks in the Sadiq of Yah. And we get far away from that one. We hear one talking about the greatness of Yah's testimony. Our minds get far away from that. But let a jokester or a clown come in with something that is silly and immature and see how the whole dynamics of the event change. Let someone come in with laughter and folly and silly. When there's a testimony of power, we get sleepy. We can't hear that. When there is something that is silly, we hear it. And we repeat it. We have not learned how to love what is written. 
Although that little child, it wasn't $780, she showed it to Hadassah and said, look what Papi gave me. Mine has writing on it. And it was just by chance she got it. Because they all got the same. You understand? This is an immature generation. I hate it. Above all things, Beth, I hate silly women. I despise stupid and immature men. But women that are silly don't even talk to me. I don't like silly women. Never have. Never want to be around them because as a young man, as I watch elderly women, they were much more mature than the young girls. And I'll just be honest, most of the women that I knew or that I was friend to say it that way, many of them sometimes were much older in their 30s. I don't like silly women because they don't have maturity. I don't like women with laughter. I don't care for laughing, crackling, and smiling all the time. I don't care for that. I've never cared for that. I think a beauty of a daughter of Tizan, her place is quietness. And that's the way this assembly should be. That's the way the house of Yisrael should be. Just be quiet. And just wait. He is our healer. And that's a fact. I don't like frivolity. I don't like laughter and foolishness. I just don't like it, Yisraya. You can call me stunned to, you know, indifferent. I am all of that then. I just don't like it. That's why I tell people when you come in, don't, 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 don't. Don't think you're going to come in, we're going to sit down and talk and laugh. It's not going to be with me. The ninth hour, the ninth hour, hallelujah, the ninth hour. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, to understand this time, the ninth of this time of final judgment, there's a precise reading of the Torah in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 25. This gives us great understanding. And we're going to look at Jagiah or Chagiah. Leviticus 25, verse 22. Leviticus. This is what Yah commanded Yisrael. He says, in this year I want... There are things among you, I want them eradicated. There shall be no oppression of the strangers of those that are in your care. He said, this is the year or we will come to the 15th year of Jubilee. And he gives us preciseness of that time. You must judge yourself. This is the final judgment of you. And he speaks here in Leviticus. I know we read, but we don't understand the implications of what we read. Leviticus 25, 22. And you shall sow the eighth year. That's the year you sow. The eighth year, Leviticus 25, 22. And you shall sow the eighth year, and yet eat of the old fruit. Uh, he said that which is old. Until the ninth year, the time of the finality. The ninth year. Until the fruit come in you shall eat of the old storehouse. We shall eat in the ninth year. Our final Judgment as to our appreciation, how we sense the direction of Almighty Yah. We must come to a conclusion of that, Yisra'ya. Why have you forsaken me? It goes seem as though that we are forsaken. And it seems that we're in our own minds and our own logic, doesn't it? Why isn't this happening for me? Why isn't that? And we don't even understand what the word azab means. We don't understand what Alma means. We got to dig beyond our little immaturity of intellectualism. Beyond our ability to read. You can't hardly read. Hardly any of us are excellent readers. That's why we do very little reading. We still got the habitual principles as... We learn from mama and grandmama. We pick it up. Every one or two chapters, we think we've done something. Yeah. Read a verse or two, we think we've finished something that day. Yeah. You've done nothing. Yeah. That's nothing. It's not worth nothing. Yeah. Because if it was, we will grow. When you feed your mind, you feed your body, you can see the growth. Yeah. Ima VCS says to me, this has been the biggest young. And look at this boy. She's talking about Yaramaya. He's been drinking the milk. Yeah. Now the boy is on chicken bones. He's ready to eat. Yeah. She look at this boy. 
He's big and thick. I don't know how much he weighs. I haven't picked him up. And so when we grow, there's a weight about us. You see the weight. When someone gains weight, you see that. When someone gains maturity, you see that. When someone gains weight in the spiritual things, you see it in their expression because uh, they have the ma'oya. When they walk, they know what they're walking about. You understand? And when they stop to talk, uh, everybody gets quiet. Everybody gets quiet. Why have you forsaken me? We're coming to the final, the akhri, the final hour, the ninth hour, we're between the sixth and the ninth hour, Yisra'ya. And when the power of death shall try us in the greatest of ways, Yisra'ya. Men don't think that they immature ways, that they open the doors for the enemy. You're not going to do that here. I don't care who you are. I don't give a damn who you are. Your mama, your daddy, you're not going to do that here. Not with me. And I'm not fearful of what you want to do. You love me because they were never a serve of us anyway. Never love nobody. Don't even know how to love. Hell, if you know how to love, you watch yourself. I know how to love. I'm constantly reproving it on me. I refine me all the time. I like to refine me. Sure I do. Listen to the prophet Haggai. In chapter 1, verse 11. One verse I want to read. I want to give you a precise wisdom of this final or the finality of judgment. And Haggai speaks of this in a great way. Hallelujah. He speaks concerning the very nature of one's concepts and thoughts, what's in their mind, what is characterized by their activities, their actions, and their ways. Haggai, one of the minor prophets, all right? Haggai, near the back of the old covenant. Hallelujah. He speaks in a way that is so profound in the book of Haggai. Haggai, chapter 1, verse 11. Yossas, as he gives him a word for the last or the final hour. Haggai, 111. Yossas, and I call for a chorev, a drought, where there's dryness. Is not there a dryness in the bones of Yisrael? Can these dry bones live? They're going to live. There's a dryness among Yisrael. He said, calls for a drought. He calls for a famine. A drought brings about a famine, doesn't it? We're not in a famine or a drought for the eating of bread because we all eat bread. But it's for the hearing of the Torah of Yah. He's going to call for a drought. That there's dryness in the bone, dryness in the soil. When there's dryness there, we are earthly vessels, right? And without the rivers of water, you cannot bring forth fruit. The peri. So he says, I call for a drought upon the land. And upon the high place, says, listen now, forgive me, yeah. I want to point this out. Now I want you all to count these off. These are the seven or the nine judgments whereby this is the final judgment. This is what it should be. He said, I call for a drought, number one, upon the land, okay? I read things and I count things. He said, upon the land, he says, and number two, it shall be upon the mountains. He says, three, upon the dagon, the corn, the substance of life. Number four, upon the yayin, the new wine. Number five, upon the oil, the refreshing, the oil of gladness. Number six, upon the ground which bring forth. Number seven, and upon men. Number eight, and upon cattle. Number nine, and upon all the labor of their hands, the final, the finality. Nine, the judgment, the completion of his judgment. This is what the prophet saw. And if you read the whole book of Haggai, I started verse one, you will see what this prophecy is about. It's about this deplorable mindset and the, and the spirit upon a nation of people. That their attitude, come on. Our attitudes have been formulated by our own corruption. And they formulate their own attitude by their own corruption and their wickedness. 
And so he gives us the nine judgment or the nine things. This is the final judgment. What else is left? That's why we're between the sixth and the ninth hour. The ninth hour, you cannot get it right. That's why they looked for all five. And did all of the shalishim of your shul, did they forsake him? They went and they turned their backs. They went their own ways. We must understand that. He's not going to forsake you, Yisrael. He's not going to all now. He's not going to divorce you like a divorced woman. You have no strength. We must go by. We must prevail. These are the nine things. This gives us the illustration of the ninth hour. That's why there was darkness upon the whole earth. The whole earth was dark. The whole land was dark. The sun did not shine. It was dark. The sun did not give its light. And we don't see the sun radiant in the face of Yisrael today because of the darkness of our own sins and our own corruption. That's why the judgment was upon Manasseh and Hezekiah. Because of the nine waters, because of the darkness of their sins. And the sins of the nation of Israel. It's vitally important. You can't get understanding of Torah just reading a chapter of Haggai. You got to search better sheets. Of Adaya. You got to search Shemoth. You got to labor to find the treasures. You're not going to get treasures by digging a little small hole and think you're going to get treasures. Yeah, it's not going to. Yeah. Yeah. And people that spend hours searching the internet, hours and days. Silly as hell. Yeah. Stupid. I wouldn't waste y'all's precious time searching no damn internet. Yeah. I would not. Come in my place, you will find me. If my heels are not kicked up, you'll find me studying. You're boasting, no, oh, I love his Torah. I love what it speaks to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The prophecy of a miserable state of a people, of their corruption. And Yah says, these are in Haggai, he's going to call drought upon the land. These are the finality of the last or the ninth hour, what it shall be. There shall be a famine in the land. It is not shall be a famine for the eating of bread or lechem, but for the hearing, but for the hearing of the Torah of Almighty Yah. And I hear from the few that we hear from, there is nothing to be heard. No one is saying anything, Yisraya. They are appeasing and soothing this corrupt flesh. Everyone thinks that he or she has a claim to a state whereby they cannot be instructed or corrected. That is a stupid man. That is a silly, immature Jezebel of a woman. And that's just a fact. It's a fact. Whether you buy it or not, it's still a fact. Hallelujah. Let me give you some truth here. I don't know if I finish this today, but I'll finish it when I finish it. Hallelujah. It says here in the book of Lamentation. He talks about the state, the conscience of his people here in the book of Echan, Lamentation, chapter 1. And we know that Yerushalayim is a representative of the state of Yah's uh, people. The word Yerushalayim means this. This is what the word Yerushalayim or the word Jerusalem mean. It implies simply this. The place, the place, the cries of Yeremiah, the place where Yah Shalom is Lomad, where it's taught. Where his peace, his Shalom is taught. You learn in Yerushalayim the Shalom of Almighty Yah. And yet the state of that nation, of that city, has become so corrupt. That's the state of our minds today. Yeah. And the cry of Yeremiah for nation and a people that, has, that had gone so far from Yah. And yet through all of that, he had not forsaken them. Yet you're sure that he bear the sins of all of us in that body. And yet Yah turned his face in the heavens from him. Yet he did not forsake him. He did not denounce him. 
He caused the power of that truth to rise up against all opposition of hell. When the demons of hell came to lay hands on him, death couldn't hold him down. Sickness couldn't hold him down. The skin worms could not penetrate. It says here in Lamentation chapter 1 verse 8. Yah says, Yerushalayim, they have grievously sinned, hate. They have, with great offense, they have sinned. It says, therefore, she is a, she's an impure and filthy place. She's a woman on her ministration. All that honored her, he said, now they zulu, they despise her, they detest her. Why? Because they have seen her evra, her nakedness, her improper behavior. Listen, he's talking about the evra, the evra, the erva. When one sees someone's nakedness, you see their improper behavior, their attitude, their personality. This is what Yah is talking about. Not because the way that she interacts with Yah, the way you interact with each other. You understand? He saw her evra, her nakedness. Her ways were not conducive as to the dictates of Torah. Yes. He says she's an akshi sa, is like a beast in the field that is, that is uh, in the thralls of perplexities. She groans. Uh, and, not, and when she does that, and she also turns backwards. She turns away from Yah. I watch over the years those that have turned away from Yah. As I said to you, the email that one write, wrote to me, I am an atheist. Uh, are you silly little cow? Do you not understand that an atheist believes in a superior order of construct? Uh, it's your own uh, damn stupid juvenile mind. Uh, you filthy little heifer. And a wicked mammy papi will embrace her and strengthen this damn dog of hell. Not I. I will be down your way. Don't you think it's proper for you to see me? I said, hell no, no. It's not proper for me to see you. Oh, I looked up the code of atheism. Yeah, there's some stupid individuals uh, because their codes can be based in religious uh, tenets as well. They're just stupid. But that is no supreme being. Uh, you are the one that calculates and determines. Well, that is a supreme being. You are supreme. You have the power over life and death to coax your mind to live or die. They are stupid yeah. as hell. Yeah. And any kind of a mammy or pappy support that. They're not even worth spitting on. I would tell the Jezebelian atheist, you wicked child of hell, she would not want to be around me, believe me. Oh, you want to be lifted up. Oh, you silly little heifer. You're so immature. Undoubtedly, you have the propensity or the desire for someone to esteem you. We need strong men. We need government. We need true warriors. We need true warriors, men. True government. Not a true warrior. You know him from a little boy. I shall my ark. Listen to this in verse 9. Her filthiness, her tumah, in her skirt. She remembers not her acharith, her last end. She don't remember her last end, what shall be. We don't remember, or we don't think of what shall be. Therefore... She came down, she fell wonderfully. She had no nacham, she had no one to comfort her. Oh, yeah, behold, my only, my great affliction of poverty and pain. For the enemy has magnified himself. Hear this in verse 11. It says, all her people saw they groan like beasts of the field. They seek, they bechash, they desire bread. They desire the bread of life. Listen. They gave batter, a barter, their pleasant thing for me to relieve their nephesh. They have, in essence, they have bartered, they have sold out 
the way of Yah, the truth of Yah, just to feed their wicked nefesh, their wicked lives with association and friendship and things to feed their desolate and desperate desire because nobody loves them, nobody cares for them, nobody is concerned about them. And yet they think that each other is a difficult thing for you to be concerned about me and me for you. That's why Yah commands his people that we join our resources together and care for each other. It's difficult to do that. And yet when Yah breaks down the shackle of our own corruption and began to reveal who us, then it is a delightful thing to do it. It is rejoicing. It's not a repressive thing. Well, I want my money. Hell, you don't have no money? No! The damn you got, it goes to the master that masters you Silly man, I want my own. You don't have a damn thing. You didn't bring anything into this world, and it is a sure thing you're not taking nothing. You're not taking a damn hat or pair of shoes, and nobody's going to ride the ride with you. You run that one by yourself. Nobody's going to tag along with you. You're going that one by yourself, and that's a fact. No doubt about that. She has polluted herself. And so she seeks the living bread of Yeshua HaMashiach. So she barters herself to find bread for her nefesh, meat for herself. Yah says, Ra'asi, that little word. He tells us to inspect. I want you to perceive and to know that, O oh Yah, and consider, for I have become vile. When a nation begins to speak like that, as the old Negro spiritual, as they would say, not my mother nor my brother, but it's me, Yah, standing in the knee. When we realize our condition and the state of our mind, that you know that you're vile and you're unclean and your ways are vile and you look unclean. When you begin to do that like a near down woman, you understand when Yah see the poverty of his nation, we can see throughout the book, as King Yeramiah pointed out to us, that even in the midst of all of the calamity, he, his hands were not shown unto his nation of people. In this last hour, the perplexities uh, shall come upon us without any kind of wisdom and understanding of that. That's why we need all the men that are wise and they speak the truth and they talk the truth. They don't have to mutter and jumble and say words that are not, uh, that, that, that do not interact with truth and they talk with preciseness and clarity. Their words are, although their grammatics may not be like yours, precise and refined, but they can speak in a way that their words are based upon the Torah and the principles of the Torah and they impregnate their minds with certain attributes of the Torah, not trying to be the master of everything, uh, but trying to master the strength uh, of an elderly man refining one's way uh, to run to the gates, not a damn jackass uh, of a fool uh, with his folly. Everything I do, my intensity is intense. I don't care how I feel. I wanted to call my friend yesterday, but I knew he was tired. I said, well, if he, come, if he comes, he comes. And, uh, of course, I enjoy it when he comes because, you know, I knew he was tired. I was too, man. I was up early that morning to say to him, As he headed out, in the garden with Yosef, the rest of the day, taking care of what I needed to, finishing up the little thing. At the last hour, saw him coming in. I said, oh, I'm happy. A little early. I see that big truck round the corner, that little old Jeep. I do. You may not, but I do. I like to see him. So as I go with him, I said, no, nah, I know he's tired. I'm not going to mess with him. But if he comes, I'll enjoy him. 
And so I heard this ruffling of the stones. I said, here he come. Ma. And then I saw this little bone here. And I said, I hear something. I hear something round the stone. And I went to the door. There he was, jetting down the road on his bicycle. And I say, this little rock here, that's who. Because the door didn't open, so I knew it was him. I saw his bike there. I said, it's got to be that little knucklehead. Hallelujah. That's a beautiful thing. Behold how tall and how pleasant. When I joined the mason tree, that was the first thing. Yeah, I was in the mason tree. I was 22 years old. I got to the seventh degree. When I found out that these were a pack of damn fools, I said, I'm not. Didn't pay no money, never paid no dues or anything. I learned the handshake so I can show everybody. But it was one of the first scriptures they taught us in that. Behold, how tough and how pleasant it is for brethren, the Achim, to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon of the head of a Haran that ran down through his beard, even down to the skirt of his garment. And that's a beautiful thing when brothers dwell, when they live, when they cooperate in the beauty of oneness, of unity. That's what unity is. It is ikhat, of unity. There's nothing. We can move any mountain up. I know it's a few of us, but there's nothing we cannot do. There's nothing. We can lay hands on a mountain. We just got to have a command. Lay hold he. You can't have a Oh, pick it up. No, you're going to have disorder there. You're going to have one that's command. And one command, lay hands on it. Lift! You lift it up. And you go with it. You can move out. And the first time you got someone complaining, everybody lose strength. Brother, you ain't picking up, so brother, you are. Brother, hot, hot, hot. Hold it, my boy. And everybody start complaining. I know what I'm saying. So you say, shut your mouth, lay hands on it. Let's go. He, hallelujah. Can we move on, make a little sense in this? Hallelujah. Ah, yes. Peter says in First Kepha, chapter 1, verse 5, this is how we are kept, Yisrael. And that's why we are kept for one purpose. First Peter In chapter 1, verse 5, 1 Peter 1, 5, look, this is how Yah is going to guard us and keep us. It's not about any special abilities you have. He says, we as a nation of people, we have been elected according to the foreknowledge of Almighty Yahweh. He says, and for your assurance, he keeps you, for you are kept. You are Shema, you are guarded. You're hedged about. You're brought in. You are kept by the power of Almighty Yahweh. We are kept by the koach, the strength of his might. You're kept by the power of Yahweh through faith. We just believe. Through faith unto your sure, for what reason? Ready to be revealed in the Acharith or the last hour. Was not your sure kept that way? Was not the power of Yahweh revealed in the last hour? And it's going to be revealing us in the last hour. Although we may think it's strange, as though some strange thing has happened unto us. There's no strange thing that has happened unto us, Yisrael. None whatsoever. We are kept by the power of Yah. It is His power that keeps us. It's not your own power because we are weak. We don't have the strength. We are only we're down. We are weak in the vision. We're kept by the power of Yah. And if you can just believe, that's the simplicity of Torah. You just believe. It is going to be revealed in the last hour. Was it not revealed in the ninth hour in the final judgment with Yahshua Hamashiach? It's going to be revealed in the ninth hour as well uh, upon this nation. It's going to be revealed then in the ninth hour. It shall be revealed. He is the one that is going to keep us. He is the one, Yisrael. Yeah, not by our own strength and might. Yah is the one that keeps us. He reminds us. He refreshes us and refines us. That's what we need ear to hear. 
This is the first commandment. That's the first commandment. To hear. To hear. We're kept by his power. You have no power to keep you. You're kept by his power. Your shoe was kept in death by his power. He rose up by his power. And the same ruach, the same power of his power that raised him up shall raise me up as well in the ninth hour, in the last day. That's why we have to be careful and guard our minds constantly against who? Now, you know, I don't have to guard against you. We need to guard against me. Why? Because the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I don't have to guard against people. People don't cause me no problem. Nobody calls me problem. Even my, even my worst of enemies. I don't know who it is or who they may be. I really, I'm not concerned about that. But people don't call me no, cause me no problem. I cause myself problem. And you're the one causing yourself problem. Your own wickedness caused you to respond the way you respond. Your own filthiness caused you to respond the way you respond. Your own immaturity caused you to respond the way you respond. Looked at this last individual here, how everyone just, we had not everyone, those that gravitated to him, he didn't have a damn thing. If he'd had something, why it didn't come to me? Yeah, they, men like to impress each other. I know more than you. I know something you don't know. They don't know a damn thing. I don't have to tell you what I know. My walk tells you what I know. So like little boys playing with toys to see, see, I know that, and, and, and they can't even hardly talk. They don't even, and men's, come on, man. That's ignorant. You don't have to know proper, adequate of language, but that's stupid. I know the word men and men with the apostrophe, what it implies, what the apostrophe S means, if that pertain to possession of. See, I went to school too. And I learned too. Because I love learning. When I was in school, I loved to learn. I love to learn in school. This is my calling. Hallelujah. We're kept by the power of Yah. Through Imona, through Yoshua Hammer Shiach. Are we a people that Yah has considered to be worthy that as he has revealed unto us that ninth hour of Yahshua HaMashiach, we're worthy. Where's the Nabi? We need the prophet. I mean, I'm not talking about little boys. We need a prophet among us. Yeah. I am not a prophet. And those that call themselves prophets, if they are prophets, I don't want to be a prophet. If they are prophets, I don't want to be a prophet. If this what I hear here today, and they call themselves a nobi, I don't want to be a nobi. They call themselves shuli shiach, an apostle, I don't want to be yet. Just make me a simple messenger. I like that better. Because of that is the strength and the beauty of the naba, the spirit of Yah that speaks through these men. Don't speak through me that way, Yah. I'd rather you speak through me like this as a simple messenger. That's a beautiful experience. Expression here in the book of Third Ezra, one of the lost books. I want to show you something. And Yah considered Ezra to show him the things that shall be in the last hour in the Akarith. He says, since Third Ezra 12 23, it says, In his last days uh, shall the Most High raise up, hear this now, he's going to raise up three kingdoms. We must understand that three is the multiples of nine. The nine, number nine, is only in a state. It is the only singular number of the singular order of the numerics. Then you go to the double or the duals of digits in ten. It can only equate in the multiples of three or three plus six. And there's a lot to that. And one day I'm going to teach you on all the variants of the numer numerology of Yah. All right, just bear with me. I know what I'm saying, okay? 
That's why we need men instead of brothers running their damn mouths. They need to be learning and studying things like this. Sitting on your ass doing not a damn thing. That's what they need to do. Yeah. Trying to prove the essence of what they are and what they have and don't have a damn thing. It makes me angry. No, I'm not just words. I'm all action. I'm all action. And it, 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 it sickens me. When there is so much that needs to be taught. There's so much that when elders sit together, even in places like this, uh, that their words radiate in the crowd. Uh, and then the little ones sit around and listen. Hell, some of the elders said they look at children like they're mad. That's a fact. I'm not going to, I don't give a damn what you say. The expression to our babies are crazy. And I'll tell them, don't look at our babies like that. Don't look at them like that. My babies love me. Sure they do, Yosef. Because they know, they sense the tenderness. They sense trust. I'm glad they trust me, but uh, I was ain't let them in my house, you understand? Unless mom is that. I don't like no girls to be around me. Why? Because that's honor. No, I'm not taking the little girls and just take them to my house. I'm not doing that. Come here, where's Nani? Okay, she's in there. Get, 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 get that what she said. Get out of here. You all can say what you want to. I don't give it's my grandbabies. That's just the way I, that's the thread I'm cut out of. I've always been like that. That's me. That's me, all right? The prophet says that he's going to raise up three kingdoms. Huh? Listen to this now in 3rd Ezra 2, 23. And renew many things therein. We know the kingdom of the Medio Persia and the Babylon and the, and the Gre Grecian kingdom uh, and the kingdom of the Romans. Uh, we know that. You see, most elderly young men, men today, most of them, you ask them well, what those kingdoms persist of and what, how's the revelation and told. They don't know a damn thing, but they, they know everything. They don't know. All the ones that are ashamed, they get all edgy and they move and they, you know, they come on and they don't like that because I'm revealing their damn weaknesses. And they want to be strong and they ain't strong. So they got a stupid looking expression on their face. They can't even tell you simple stuff like that, even in, in the edifice or teaching us that we may learn that. Can't even teach that. But they know everything. He talks about three kingdoms. It's important because I had said that. Don't hold me to it, Akmikaya. I want to do a series. I know, listen, when I say that, don't expect me to do what you all think as a finish end to anything because it just doesn't work that way. But on the fourth kingdom, I wish one of you all will do it. One of you, I, I won't fight you. The fourth kingdom. It is a dynamic teaching. It is of great essence. What does the number four implies and why the fourth kingdom? The last kingdom. Verse 24, and those that dwell therein with much oppression... Above all those that were before them, therefore they are called the heads of the eagles. For there are they that shall accomplish his wickedness. And they shall finish his last end. There's a people that's going to accomplish the last end of Almighty Yah. I know we think, I know we think that the adversary of Yah HaShatan, that he is not working in... In order with Almighty Yah, you're wrong. He does just, he is commanded to do what he is doing. And he does it more faithful than we do. He is given a mandate when Yah says, uh, you go and you strip Eob of everything. But you cannot touch his nephesh. You can't take the life of the Ruach. You're not going to draw out his Ruach. You're going to touch him, his youngins, his body. You will not allow that. He did not draw that from Eob. He touched him every way that one could be touched. He works in consort meant with Yah. Concert with Yah. He did everything that he commanded him to do, did he not? But he didn't touch him. 
And so is he doing it today. He's going to reveal the wickedness. He's going to reveal who's on his side, Yisrael. Why? So that he can finish his work in these last end. And whereas you saw the great head appear to no more. It's significant that one of them uh, shall die upon his bed. Uh, he's talking about the kingdom of the rule of these powerful entities uh, that Yah has raised up to show forth the excellence of wickedness. He said, for the two that remain shall be slain with the sword, with the word of Yah. With the word of God, just like the two Noviim, the Noviim shall walk in the street of Yerushalayim. They shall be slain with the sword by the sword of Yah. And then in three days, the bodies are going to rise up. All of this is of great significance. This is to show us the Gaba, the strength of Yah, how we shall prevail. We're going to prevail, Yisrael. He said, for the sword of the one shall devour the other. But at the last at the last, at the Acharith, shall he fall through the sword himself. You that pick up your sword and bear your sword, you're going to die by it. The sword of your wickedness, your corruption, your attitude, your anger, your hostility, you're going to die that way. Now, that's a fact. I don't give a damn whether I ever see any of us again. When I say that, you don't want to be with me. I don't want you around me. I don't care who you are. No one is going to appease you in your wickedness. I'm so glad you stayed with me, mama. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All these years, you can't judge me. You've seen my life. You've seen what I am. And before you, she was there. For you, she was there. I don't care how you've gotten upset with me. And there ain't nobody in here hasn't gotten upset with me. Nobody that's met me has gotten upset with me. That's all right. I don't change one thing at all. I don't care if you get upset with me. And the one that you ought to be getting upset with is you. Yisra'ya, I'm totally honest. My ups, when I get upset, it's only for a moment. I, I don't regress into that. I just don't. I don't. That's not my nature. I'm upset. Okay, let's, let's roll. Let's roll, baby. That's it. It's over with me. But to hold on, prolong things, I haven't done that. Can I close with a little assurance to us? I want to read a few verses here. And I'm going to close. All right. We're going to pray for those of Chod Blant, her family, and Zachin Shimbri, and Achmikaya, his family, our Ag Frank, and his precious Isha, Diana, and our Chod Diane Rees, and our Chod Miriam there in the Baltimore, Maryland, Eastern Shore area, and all of you are friends. We don't call your name out. Our Ag Darrell, that called in for Zachin Yaramiya last night, his testimony. You sometimes may think your conditions are grave, and yet you hear someone like him, him and his wife, and he doesn't have very much money. No one knows who you are. Yet, <clears throat> the last time he sent an offering, he said, Ray, I know it's not much. I said, my friend, you don't have to send anything. My concern is not how much you send. How are you and your wife doing? Then he calls in last night. I said, that's not my concern. See, his voice is one of healing and strength. We need that. Maybe my voice tear down and uproot, but yet I'm glad we have the strength of the voices of the, to bring about the healing process. I'm glad of that. And so when I hear him talking to Zarkane, his patience, his delivery with him, it was a beautiful thing. I enjoyed it. The work of Yah is greater than you and me. I don't, I'm not trying to build me a little kingdom here, build me a work here. I don't have no ministry. I tell people all the time, I have no ministry. I have no ministry. None whatsoever. You can't do anything by yourself. So I need Israel. Sit and offering all of you today. I want to give you a few disclosures of comfort and confidence. 
Here in the book of Yohanan and in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 27. The great witness of this Yudut of Yoshua HaMashiach. Here in John 12, 27. Yoshua, knowing that it was the final hour. He says, now is my nephesh trouble. And what shall I say? John 12, 27. He said, my nephesh is sarah, great agony of pain and affliction, trouble. He said, what can I express? What can I speak or utter? He says, Abba, deliver me from this hour. He wasn't asking that the shackles of the experience be broken. He was saying to him, as your sure is our deliverer, your shach, save your truth in this hour. You know he wasn't saying, take me down, don't allow. He says, for this cause, I came to the final hour. For this cause, Yisrael, he's going to bring us to the final hour. For the cause of his name is going to be honored and esteemed above all names. For this cause he brought him to that hour. He said, I know it. He wasn't saying, take me down. Don't allow this to happen. For everything, for that cause, he brought you there. He said, for this cause, he has brought me to this, uh, read this, uh, this hour, what, the ninth hour, the final hour. The hour to judge everything that is in me, to, to, to judge it by even, uh, even the, the, the world's standard, uh, but above all your standard. He's brought you to this hour. For this hour, he says, and this is the reason I, I was brought forth to come to this hour. And that's why you are in the state you're in uh, for this hour. The hour that is ahead. That's why Yisrael. For this cause, he brought me to this hour. For this cause, I came, I entered into this hour. Verse 28, he says, O Maria Abba, magnify, lift up, esteem your name. And then the Shemaim opens and a voice came from the Shemaim saying, I have both magnified it and he says and I will magnify it just again for this hour Yisrael he's brought us unto this hour that his name shall be magnified again in the finality of all things he's going to magnify he's going to leave a remnant of people among the nations of the earth that shall call upon his name Yisrael that's what he is going to do. He's going to have a people that's going to call on for his day. He has brought you to this hour. And for this hour, he has caused us to, to enter in. And above all that, in the final hour, he makes this statement. Just like to Zephaniah, Sophonia, he makes this statement in the book of Lucas, in the last hour, in the final hour. Lucas 23, verse 34. Then said Yoshua, Abba, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his clothing, and they began to cast lots. See, in this hour, unless we are forgiven, we're going to gamble our nephesh away. We're trying to look for some kind of reprieval or some kind of answer. And it's not going to come that way. It's only, only going to come through the truth, the Torah of Almighty Yah. Forgive them, Yah. Forgive them. For they don't even understand. It's a generation that doesn't even understand their actions, their attitude. They don't understand Yisra They don't even understand what they do. They don't. And we don't understand that. That's why Yisra'ya, our expression in our poem, it expressed everything. 
Well, that lady grabbed my arm the other day when she touched me. Listen to me. I want all y'all to hear me. I didn't look at her like that. I didn't look at her like that bad. She wanted to let me know, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, ma'am, you really? I said, everything is well, ma'am. I didn't look at her just anyway. And that gave her the assurance of confidence, a pleasant time. I may not ever see her again. I wouldn't know if I saw her again anyway. But that's what we present. You understand? For out of the abundance of the land flows the issue. The filth, the nidah. Forgive them, y'all. For they don't even know what they're doing. And we don't even know what we're up against. We don't even know what we're doing. That's the sad part. We don't know. My prayers always, y'all, raise up the mighty messengers. Strong young men. We need that. And we should, as elderly men, be a strength to our young men. I will never discourage these young men. If anything, I will be a strength to them. It's only a few. And I want them to know that I am as faithful to him as he is to me. If I work with him, I will labor as hard as he labors. I won't take advantage of his faithfulness, his beauty, and his strength. I don't do that. That's not the way I operate. Because it's going to take the strong young men to feel we have. Something happens to be strong and they bind together and don't allow the works of hell to destroy even their love for Yah. So that's why we need strong young men. He called the young men why? Because they're what? Strong. He called the young men because they're strong. And what else? They have what? Have what? They have overcome the wicked one. He called old men because they have an experience and held their silly. We talk, but ain't no jackass playing. They know that. Do you laugh at times? Sure, we laugh at times. But it's very controlled, too. Hmm? He'll get on me. I say, you see that you sit at this man? You understand what he's doing? Give me no room. That's how we do it. But I'm not a jackass or a clown. Never have been, never liked it, and never will do it. Even as a young, stupid boy, still ignorant. I was never that way. Never. And the reason why can I tell you? I learned something at 23, 24 years old by Evangelist Hartsfield. To always love correction. To always. And that's why I've been able, Yah has enabled me to know things that most men don't know. They don't know what I know. You're boasting. No, I'm not boasting. No. No. Because I submitted. And most men have never learned how to submit. Because the arrogance of their pride won't let them submit. That's why the Torah tells you, husband and wife, even in your discourses, you're submitting yourself one unto another in the fear of Yah. And then it tells your wife when all that is over, then submit and to be subject unto the arbiter. So they haven't learned how. That's why they haven't learned that. That's why men don't submit to their wives. So then why don't submit? And then she becomes such because she knows that he's going to make the, the arbitrary decision is going to be right for her in her home. And that's just a fact because she has confidence in his strength and his beauty. She sees the strength of his beauty. She sees his countenance. She looks upon his facial features when he's lying in bed. He doesn't even know. And the dim of the night, she can see his eyes. She can see his mouth. She looks at her man. She surveys him. She's tentative. She's not feeling that well. She's going through a period of, uh, of things. She looks on him and looks at his face. She sees the beauty of his lines and the beauty of his wisdom. And same thing with the man. He walks in there and see her beauty, her charm. 
see her facial expression. See the charm of her closed eyes and her mouth open. And he looks at that. Gives him assurance of his place that he must be the gatekeeper. He must watch over. That's what you old men are. You're placed in the midst of men to show the young men how to keep the gate. And you don't do it by running your damn mouth. You do it by your actions. Your actions speak greater than your words. You show them. You show them how to keep the gate. The shaha, the gate, the gate of their minds, the gate of their heart, the gate that enter into the city of Yerushalayim. You show them how to keep the sha'a, sha'a. You show them, you teach them. And you teach them by your walk because your walk is right and your talk is right. And they learn from that and then they are appreciative. Ya Barak Yisra'ya, we greet you all, we pray the Yas blessings. Come on, Zachim. Rest upon you all, we pray that Yah grant you his shalom and your sure's mighty name and that he gives you comfort this Shabbat. Set it all free. To help. Again, we do greet you all that are listening by VF Live Stream. And we brought Yahweh for this beautiful day He has given us. Time of rest, celebration. He has fed us well, Yisrael. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let us put this meal to work. Hallelujah. In these bodies that we may be strengthened to carry on and to press on to see what the end shall be. You know that Yahweh, He desires and He has designed everything to have a process. Everything to have a step. As I think about even the insects or uh, uh, the butterflies, how they start off as being grubs or caterpillars, as we call them. And their main purpose in the first few stages of their lives is to consume as much as possible. That they may prepare themselves for a time of dormancy, Israel. You know, this is the time of dormancy that the world and the nations are, are going through. Well, it, it seems like the Ruach of Yahweh is not even moving, but yet it is, Yisrael, amongst his people. So we must take in, we must consume as much as we need, Yisrael, that we may have the reserve and the, the substance that we need to press on. And then even at the time they, they spend their cocoons or whatever, as they grow, they're pressed and they're tight in the situations that they're in, Yisrael. But yet when they break out of that shell, there is presented a beautiful sight and a beautiful thing, a butterfly. Hallelujah. And it's implicit, it's so beautiful, even in the colors, that Yahweh have designed this. So shall, so shall the house of Yisrael. Yahweh, he shall bring us out of this tight place of this situation, Yisrael, that we may present unto him a beauty and an offering that is unto him, that's a sweet and smelling savor. Hallelujah. That we as a people will give him honor and give him praise in all things. Hallelujah. Let us stand to our feet, Yisrael. Hallelujah. 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 Let us shoot, let us turn unto Jerusalem, the city of Almighty Yahweh, a city that has built, been built by not man's hands, but by his hands. Almighty Yahweh, we do told you for this day you have given us your Ruach that has dwelled and rested upon the house of Yisrael this day. We just ask Yahweh again that you would touch all Yisrael and keep us, Yahweh, Yahweh, in your hands, which is our place of safety, under your wings, Abba Yahweh. And all things we do, Barak, we give you Toda. In the precious and mighty name of Yahshua HaMashiach, we do pray. Hallelujah. 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 Yahweh. Hallelujah. Yahweh. Shalom, shalom. Hallelujah.